Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Um, uh, a couple things. Uh, first off, I lied about what I was going to lecture about. Um, so they think I'm going to talk about one thing, um, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so I hope you will stay. <laughs> Once I, I saw the poster today and I thought, wow, that's an interesting lecture. I, 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 I came on the right day because I'll actually learn something. I don't want to hear that lecture tonight. But, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. But, uh, but I want to try to give some context to that. Because as Geraldine said, uh, I mean, I have a, uh, the lecture is kind of split along the same uh, personality lines as my career. One part of my career has been as a writer, a curator, a theorist, uh, largely uh, involved in um, yeah, debates and contemporary criticism around architecture. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time in Holland, was very involved in the Dutch thing before it became a cool thing and then got involved with it even after it did become so. Um, so I've spent a lot of time writing uh, about architectural education, about theory. Um, uh, and then more recently, the last 15 years, I went to Los Angeles in 1998 and to run the graduate program uh, at SciArc, Southern California Institute of Architecture. Um, and there I also started a program that Geraldine's talking about called Metropolitan Research and Design. It was a postgraduate program focused on urban research and design. And I did something there that <clears throat> got me in a lot of trouble when I first arrived. First arrived, um, I gave a lecture and typically at SciArc, when you give a lecture, the afterwards, the board of directors would give you a dinner. And they would take you to this room and, make, and give you a dinner. And Tom Main sponsored my dinner that night. And, and that lecture was about all the things that were beginning to happen in the Netherlands. Uh, this was before, I mean, Rem Kohlhaas was big, even then. Um, but uh, we didn't really, people didn't know a lot about MVRDV or uh, all the other kind of offices that we now all know very well. <coughs> at the dinner, um, I had disparaged Frank Gehry at dinner, I mean in my lecture. Not, not aggressively, I just was saying nice things about the Dutch and apparently that meant I was saying bad things about Frank Gehry uh, to Tom Main. At the dinner, Tom says, uh, you know, you won't last six months in this town talking about that kind of stuff, that Dutch stuff. And I said, okay, we'll see. So I did, I, I was there 10 years. Um, and, uh, and now, uh, yeah, and, 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 and got to know Tom and worked with him and did a lot of things with him. So, so one part of my uh, career has been this kind of theoretical stuff. The other has had to do with running, starting programs. I'm now at the University of Kentucky. Uh, we have a school, that we don't have a nice building like this. I'm very envious, fantastic building, uh, great place, great people. I've had a great time here today. Um, but we're about the same size in terms of students. We're a college of design. We have, a, we have a school of architecture, a school of interior design, and a historic preservation program, and are looking to start an undergraduate design degree. Uh, I mention all that because uh, I'm very interested in curriculum development and program development. Um, and one of the things I've written a lot about, and what I'm gonna talk a little bit about in the first half of this, is to give some background to what I want to argue is a new intellectual paradigm that's emerging in architecture and design in general that has everything to do with what I'm supposed to talk about, which is design, innovation, and economic development, but which you can't understand unless you understand the first part of this. Um, and, and, and what it really has a lot to do with uh, is that room right across the hall that you have over here now, this fab lab, and all the stuff you have in there, your th the 3D printers and the CNC machines and the laser cutters and all that, and how those technologies are used and how they're taught. Um, uh, I, was, I went to SciArc in 1998, and there was at that time a big fight about whether or not to use computers or not. And Neil Denari, the director, wanted to make it a hardcore computer school, yeah? And uh, we introduced computers, obviously, and software, and before you know it, Maya, 3D animation software, all that stuff, you know, came in. There was huge fights between people who did that and people who did everything with a pencil. Um, and SciArc, as you may know, is a school that historically was known for model making. 
you, know, you, could, you could really think through design with models in a way that you can't with a pencil or with a, on the screen. And we had this, this struggle for years until we finally bought 3D printers and CNC machines because with those, uh, initially at SciArc, we did, uh, you do thesis, you know, students would, in their senior year, would basically have an office and they would have underclassmen make their models and work on a team with them. So the way you observe thesis when I arrived is you walk into a room and you see a thesis student who's the leader with about eight or ten other students and they're all on the floor making a model. They're all, it's a group project. When we started to introduce the computer and Maya and Alias and all the versions and iterations of 3D animation software after that, you didn't see that anymore. What you saw were people lined up at the plotter waiting for it to spit it out. So you go from this kind of group activity where everybody's like, you know, give me a sandwich, here's a coffee, do this, to, you know, to this. You know, just waiting for the, so you go from a real social activity to a singular kind of activity. That didn't change a lot until we brought in these technologies where you can translate what happens on that screen into a physical model. Then people can sit around and have a discussion and a debate about what you did with that model and you can make another one. Now, it's important because this idea of using those technologies as means of designing, creating a prototype, having that prototype be probed, questioned, interrogated, and having the results of that be, uh, be, uh, be a new kind of knowledge that then, go, then you take to the next phase of the design, redesign. This kind of iterative process is not what most people have been using these tools and technologies for. They've been using them for the same, in the same ways that we've made models uh, before. And uh, I'll give you one other quick SciArc example before I get and show you some pictures, which is what you want to see anyway. This is SciArc, by the way. Um, uh, when we first got a lot of this equipment, we, had a, we did a studio one summer. There's a guy named Bill McDonald who teaches at Columbia University. And Bill did this 21st century studio. He was making models for a show that Frederick Migaru was curating um, at the Pompidou in, in, in Paris. And he was making, you know, so 21st century software, 21st century cool guy, 21st century clothes, 21st, I mean, everything was 21st century. Everything was black. You know, the boards were black, his suits were black, everything was black. I drive into the, this is a summer studio, I drive into the parking lot and I see this, like, what is this? Tables in the parking lot, 20 tables. It looked like a medieval workshop. It was all of my students with sandpaper sanding the models that they had created with the 21st century technology. It's like. There's, what is the disconnect here? There's some weird, and what they were doing was using 3D animation software to make these models, and they were gonna put beautiful red car paint on them and make them cool. So, so really what the, what the technology was about was, I got a great idea, I'm a genius, here's my idea, let's make a model with that, put red car paint on it, into the story. Instead of using the technology as a thinking tool, as a way to think through the design, create iterations, and also create design knowledge, that can be repurposed. It was simply a way to make something fast and cool and wavy gravy and seemed like it was 21st century. That's a big issue today. Now, a lot of people think that's an issue of technique and a lot of people think that's an issue, um, I think, of style, but it's really, in my opinion, an issue that has to do with the relationship between thinking and doing, between thought and action, between design as a way to produce concepts and design as a way to make stuff and what I want to talk a little bit about is that, and then how we go from that to a model in schools where the production of design knowledge becomes e just as important as the thing, as the object. In fact, it becomes even more important because you can repurpose it and it can be transferred from project to project. In fact, I would argue that only the, the production of design knowledge is going to make us um, viable in the future. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So, so what I want to go, what I want to do is to, is to kind of give a little historical sweep or tell a little story um, backtracking from basically from parametricism uh, to parametric thought in design. And then I'm going to show you some examples of work that we do that take advantage of this. It's kind of, it, it, hearing me talk about it sounds like a disconnect. It sounds like, 
you know, wavy gravy AA cool stuff and then making houseboat projects. But it's not. It's, it's more, it's, it's less, it's more connected. I hope it will be more connected than that. Um, okay, could we go to number three on the, okay, so I'm going to, um, mm, thank you, I was worried. So, uh, so these are, uh, um, th these are so, um, these are some words that describe what I want to talk about in this first half. What is design today? What's design research? What's design knowledge? What's the status of prototyping? Um, what is technique and why is it so important? What is design and design innovation and how can it add economic value from the scale of an object all the way to the scale of an urban plan? Um, and yeah, so I'll start with this. This is, uh, uh, I, I, I was at Sire for 10 years. Um, one of the things I tried to do there was to encourage the development of a model of research, or kind of a, Sire as a, as a kind of a, uh, as a laboratory, it always thinks of itself and claims itself as a laboratory. It claims to be a vanguard institute. It claims to be an institute of innovation. I think all those things are, are not true. Um, but it's been moving in that direction. And I, I, I want to point out, I'm talking about SciArc largely because it's a caricatured example of many of the things that we're doing wrong. Um, but it has enormous potential uh, still. So uh, I hadn't been back in probably four or five years, and I went back to thesis reviews two years ago. And it, this was a, a week of events where they did thesis review, the graduation, and then they had this all-star panel of the super old guard, Vanguard. Um, and uh, they were all talking about, now this was after the downturn. This is like, I, this is two years into our, you know, plummet over the edge. And uh, they're talking about, this is the discussion about beauty. So, so, so the thesis discussion was a, thesis, a discussion about beauty in architecture. I, I don't have a problem with beauty. Beauty is fabulous, I love it. So I, I just thought, like, why, why are they talking about beauty? Aren't we worried? Aren't, aren't, there, aren't there problems? Yes, there are. I don't have this thing turned on. <laughs> yeah. So they do the thesis in this Thunderdome thing. Has anybody been to this thing before? It's quite spectacular. They make this thing. The students make it. It's cool. It's fantastic. It's great. I love it that they do this. And they, they make a different Thunderdome every summer. Then they all get inside the Thunderdome. And they all talk about how great they are, and, uh, and they're very excited about being there. Now, this is Peter Cook, uh, who comes, who's a, who frequents SciArc, and is a kind of a fellow traveler of the SciArc kind of I'm a cool vanguard design world, world view. And Peter is telling a story at graduation about how he's been coming back and forth to SciArc for many, many years. And what he loves so much about SciArc is that even the faculty there are like children. They just make little funny things and they play with them. They just play with, and I'm sitting there thinking like, I'm looking, because at this point, I've been the dean of a college of design in the state of Kentucky, a very poor state, um, where my budget has been cut 2%, 4%, and then 2% from now on. And I'm sitting here listening to Peter Cook tell these parents, because these are parents and students are here, that their students have just spent about $150,000 for this education, and basically what they've been doing for four years is playing with toys, all of them. <laughs> so I'm just thinking, this guy is good, because if he can convince them and they come back, then I'm, I'm, I've, I'm, I'm missing something here. Um, so anyway, it was a great discussion. Uh, Peter was also giving a, a, a kind of a lead in to another event, which was that long table, and then another event that was gonna happen the day after, which was a lecture by Patrick Schumacher. Um, Patrick uh, is, of course, you know, one of the principals at Zaha Hadid Architects and has been responsible for creating a kind of intellectual paradigm behind the designs. Of course, Zaha probably has no idea about this intellectual paradigm and has no interest in it, but Patrick has published this spectacular book. How many people know the book Parametricism? Oh my God, so I don't, I don't have enough haters here tonight. <laughs> Just hate loud uh, and, and powerfully. Um, I don't hate it, but, it's a, it, but this book is part of a problem. Uh, Patrick in this book says, parametricism is the answer to all contemporary design. 
Um, it's what we do. It just, it just so happens it's what they do. Um, and, uh, and, if, and everybody eventually will be doing this, uh, one way or the other. Parametricism is everything. It's a new style, he says. And by style, he really tries to suggest that it's a research paradigm, but he really means a style. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can read it, but, but uh, this is a very typical kind of story that a certain character tells. And this is a story that goes from, I don't know, it goes from Gothic and it goes, it ends up with parametricism. So you, he goes through the history of styles and it ends up with what they're doing, right? That's, a, that's always a good story. You, you know, you start out with medieval and you end up like with what we're doing in my office now. That's, <laughs> that's great. So that's what he does. Now, there's a special, there are two special words I want to use to describe that story and people who do that. One of them is, an, is ideologist. Now, that's a term that old-fashioned people like me who were trained as commies will, will know and understand. But the other word is bullshitter. That's for the younger. That's for the youth. So these are the same words, but they mean the same thing. And uh, you'll, you'll see what I mean by this in a second. Now, this is a, this is a, a, a kind of a close-up. This is what parametricism looks like. And you produce it using all those tools that you have over there, which just automatically, inevitably result in forms that look and perform like this. You know? That's, this, is where, this is where everything will go. Now, Zaha Hadid architects are designing a lot of things, so you know, he may not be wrong. I don't know. Uh, I hope so. Um, if you're him, these are the kind of, this is the world you live in. This is, this is the, these are the buildings you design. These are the people you hang out with, Brad Pitt, Frank Gehry, Zaha. <laughs> these are the things that you make. It's a very cool 21st century world. And I love it. I mean, I would love to be there, but I'm not there. Now, so I went to, the, I went to this event. I went to thesis reviews. And I, I was sure that four years later, I was going to find something different, you know, something. But in fact, I found even more of the same. Now, they think it's different, but it's not. What I, what I went to was a particular review where a student had, this is a, this is a master's degree student. Uh, this student, uh, this was, he had, it's a two-year program, final project. This is the, pro I'm going to show you the project. This, this is the final project. Now, it's a beautiful project, and it's spectacular. This is, the, that's, this is the project. Now, it's, it's very beautiful, and so I'm on the review. I think Florencia was here Monday, Florencia Pita. She, she was on this review, and that's Patrick Schumacher. They both immediately understood it. They got it immediately. Um, and, and so they look at it, and they, they start, now, what, what the thesis is about is, is, a, is a single technique. It is about one technique. This is the, the thesis, two years' work, final project, a single technique. And so the student made this thing. It's very beautiful. I don't get it. I'm having a hard time <laughs> understanding. Patrick, of course, is immediately Florencia. All the SIRE people are fascinated. The student clearly is leading the charge. I don't know if that's a bullhorn he has there or what, but, but he's, they get it. The technique thing, it's like, of course you would do two years of work on a technique. What, why wouldn't you? Are you, are you crazy for asking? I, I just didn't, I didn't get it. I'm still trying to, <laughs> it takes a long time. I never really got it. I never, I never got it. Now, one of the reasons I didn't get it is they, they kept talking about this as, as a form of research. So one of, the, one of the stupid questions I asked the student is, what will you do with such a technique? I mean, you've done this. You, it's beautiful. It's a, you've, you've mastered the skill, and the technique is quite impressive. What, what will you do with it? And the, and the jurors all looked at me like, who is this rube? What, what is this <laughs> kind of a question is that? And it, but, but anyway, it just it, it, my trip back, there, and I'm going tomorrow. So I, this is all kind of angst and worry about going back. Um, but. Uh, but, uh, but, it, but, but this little review and this story kind of illustrates a bit of the problem that I sort of alluded to earlier. It's a problem, I think, not so much about the student, it's not so much about the technique, it's not about Patrick, it's not about parametricism, it's about uh, the, the fact that we haven't recognized, I think that we're in a different paradigm which suggests a different relationship between thought and action, and we don't know how to teach in that paradigm yet. I don't think. I don't think we do. I think we're, we're fine. We're figuring that out. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. Now, this, 
This was a slide. <laughs> this, is, this could be one of the inevitable results of this. Uh, I didn't, I was not clever enough to come up with this. There's a this website in uh, LA called Arconnect that, that, that produced this. But um, for older people like me, um, uh, this all, uh, Greg, this is Greg Lynn, by the way, Frank Gehry, Hernan Diaz Alonso, um, I can't recognize the face, Tom Main, Eric Owen Moss, and I think it's Peter Cook down here. So this is a, this is a, you know, all-star lineup. I, I tried to figure out the parallels in The Last Supper. <laughs> Greg Lynn is obviously clearly who he is. There is also something in the, in Abbey Road. If you've, there's something going on here with Greg and the Whites. I, don't, I, I haven't really looked at that carefully yet, but there's something there. Okay, so enough fun. Now I'll do a chart. Now, now you can all leave. Um, uh, I just want to show this, just to say that this is part, what, the comments I've been making and this lecture and, and, and some of this is really about a kind of a historical argument about where we have been and maybe where we're going, and it's not, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not going to go through all this, but what I want to say is that, is that um, th what I want to focus on is this blue stuff at the bottom. And what, what I want to make an argument about is to say that uh, modernity really, you know, you could say that it begins with the Greeks. You could say that it begins uh, um, with Descartes. You could say that it begins uh, in the Enlightenment, which I have here. So let's just say it begins, and it goes, I'm going to say it goes to the 1960s. What I've tried to lay out here is a kind of uh, economic paradigm that leads to a philosophical paradigm that has to do with what I want to call an intellectual dominant. Uh, by that I mean the way that most people think about the relationship between thought and action, that relationship. So I, I put this up because I, I believe one can make a historical argument about this. So modernism, Postmodernism, which is, in my view, is a very short period, and really it's simply about criticizing this and arguing for something more fundamental to replace it. Um, uh, without, I don't want to go through that whole thing, but I, what I want to talk about is this. This is, this is really kind of at the heart of these comments I was making about models, parametricism, parametric thought, uh, those machines. Better talk just a little bit about this and say that if modernism, wherever we start, wherever we date its beginnings, I, I want to argue is about ideals, about idealistic thought, about universal absolute truth. It's a, it's a model wherein um, using scientific or philosophical inquiry, you try to discover universal truth. And once you've discovered those truths, those truths guide action. That is a very I mean, that is a model, if you know modernist architecture, you know it very well. The manifesto is an instantiation of those idealistic thoughts, and it's meant to guide the, de the development and building of a future. It's, what a, that's, it's a blueprint for a future. So a manifesto is precisely ide ideals encapsulated in, a, in, in, a, in you know, 10 points, 12 points, 50 points, that guide future action. So, so action is guided by right thought, by ideals. And in architecture, those were, those were guided by utopian thinkers, by the utopian vanguard, who knew and could know what was going to happen in the future, who, would gu who could guide the future. What happens in postmodernism, in my view, is that the ideals of modernism get replaced by ideologies. And what happens is the, these absolute universal truths get called into question, and a whole variety of, cho of, of um, alternatives come to attempt to replace the ideals. So a whole variety of ideologies come to replace the dominant truths that modernism espoused. Postmodernism, we all know. I thought it was dead, but it's coming back. I don't know if you've noticed that, but there's a huge exhibition uh, at the V&A in London. Uh, there are two new books on postmodernism, uh, so it's not gone. Uh, it's uh, postmodernism. Deconstructivism, Folding in Architecture, 1994, Jeffrey Kipnis uh, and Greg Lynn, uh, Critical Regionalism, crypto dualism Materialism, that's just one of my fun ones. That's anything with a Sanford Quinter introduction. It's a, it's a very specific kind of ideology. Um, parametricism, 
is an ideology. Sustainism is something I, I ran across lately. It's, it's one of the most unbelievably awful things I've ever encountered. It's, it's, uh, but I'll show you some, something about that in a minute. Um, it's driven by a theory vanguard or a, post -mo or a POMO kind of rear guard. So these vanguard thinkers who produce idealistic truths that guide the future are replaced by these critics who criticize the universality of, of, of idealistic thought, and they say, this we do instead. What this, these this is are are ideologies, or in some cases they're called styles. Schumacher's is a new version of that. Yeah? You may have noticed in his little history, you, you didn't find modernism. You found a history of styles, but modernism is not a style. It's not a style, I would say. What I want to say is that this period, 60s to the 90s, was, was nothing more than a critique of that and an argument that something else should emerge. And for the last 15 years in our history theory classes, this is the crap we've been teaching. Sorry to use that word. I know because I've taught it and I've written most of the articles, I've written a lot of the articles that are involved with this. So I know this world very well. The problem with this paradigm is that if this is what we teach and we're using those tools, we're, pretty dr we're dramatically out of sync because these tools, these, this intellectual paradigm does not correspond to that. This corresponds to a paradigm where thought guides action. I want to argue that we're emerging into a, new, a different paradigm where thought, where thinking and doing are really in, involved in a kind of an iterative process where, um, where the, where the where the ambitions of thought are neither to come up with idealistic universal truths nor ideological critiques that replace them with styles or agendas, but instead the production, what, what thought is about is the production of useful, actionable knowledge that can be uh, uh, used in a project or that can be repurposed because it's cataloged and used for future projects. And that knowledge, I want to argue, is called intelligence. Uh, and that knowledge is produced by each practitioner, by each office, and it's resident in that office's work. Now, I'm going to give some examples in a second. So we go from utopian vanguards, you know, uh, Corb, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, theory vanguards, Charles Jenks, um, Peter Eisenman, Della, to design intelligencers. And those are basically just people who are practicing in the world. Uh, so, it's not just about a return to practice. It's about a shift in intellectual paradigm. I want to argue. OK. Um, ideals, we know what those are. Those are pretty clear. We all, those are, or if you believe me, uh, this is, these, these, are, these are ideas. Ideologies are people like this. Uh, 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 Peter Eisenman. Uh, that's not many me. That's, um, that's actually Jean Nouvel. Um, people like Bernard Chumi, whom I love, but who are so ideologically driven that even in a black and white photograph he has on a red scarf, yeah? <laughs> These are the kinds of debates that we saw in the 80s and 90s. My ideology is better than yours, Peter Eisenman versus Leon Creer. Um, oppositions, the journals, everything was driven by this oppositional ideological discourse that was about nothing more than cr criticizing and getting rid of modernism and replacing it with their own style, like Patrick. It ends up with me. It's what we're doing. Yeah? <coughs> or, you know, POMO, or 1980, uh, Presence of the Past, Paolo Portuguese's uh, catalog for the Venice Biennale, Deconstructivist Architecture, uh, 1988, Philip Johnson, Mark Wigley, and all those, uh, all those guys. Um, Folding in Architecture, 94, um, uh, Jeff Kipnis and Greg Lynn, they'd, r they'd run out of things to do with poor Jacques Derrida. The only French guy they could find left was uh, Gilles Deleuze. He just published a book on the Baroque called The Fold. Beautiful. Worked out really well. Folding in architecture. Jesse Reiser's book, only because Sanford wrote the introduction, I had to put one of those in there. Sanford Quinter did. Um, Sustainism. I don't know if you know this book. I hope no one likes it. It's the most awful book I've ever seen in my life. It's basically a, a 250 pages of advertisements for why sustainism is a new modernism. It's just, it's just awful. Uh, parametricism, another ideology, Patrick Schumacher's uh, argument that there's a new style. Now, what is intelligence? Uh, I've got to be careful because I'll, I'll talk too long. Intelligence is different than ideals, which seek universal truth, 
And it's different from ideology that critiques that and offers something in its place, because it's not about truth in that sense at all. It's about something very different. Um, I don't know if you know this book. Uh, this guy now is, this is a kind of pretty old book. It's maybe five or six, seven years old. Jeff Hawkins is the guy who invented the Palm Pilot, invented the software. Um, after he did make a lot of money, he went back to UC Berkeley and did a PhD in neurobiology and wrote this book as a result of it. And what he came up with this, uh, in the book is a pretty interesting idea about intelligence. It's pretty different than the AI model of intelligence, and I think it's, it's useful. Um, uh, he says, intelligence is measured by the capacity to remember and predict patterns in the world, including language, mathematics, physical properties of objects, and social situations. Your brain receives patterns from the outside world, stores them in its memories, and makes predictions by combining what it has seen before with what is happening now. Prediction is not just one of those things your brain does. It is the primary function of the neo neocortex and the foundation of intelligence. The cortex is an organ of prediction if we want to understand what intelligence is, what creativity is, how your brain works and how to build intelligent machines, we must understand the nature of predictions. Human cortex is particularly large and therefore has a massive memory capacity. It is constantly predicting what you will see, hear, and feel, mostly in ways you are unconscious of. These predictions are our thoughts, and when combined with sensory input, they are our perceptions. I call this view of the brain the memory prediction framework of intelligence. Now, basically, what he says is this. Our brains are, are mechanisms for writing uh, massive amounts of patterns. And what we do is we project those patterns onto the world. And when those patterns we project do not accord with what we find, that is new information that then gets added and rewritten in the form of new patterns. What this means is that the, this, is that the, is that the brain is not a storage device for more and more and more stuff. It is a means of constantly producing new knowledge that transforms and changes over time, like wiki. It's like, a, it's like Wikipedia. Your brain is more like Wikipedia, he says. What's interesting about this is this memory prediction framework is that it, it, it oper this, this idea of projection, non-accord and rewriting is very much, I, I'm going to argue, like prototyping. It's kind of a, it's, your brain is a means of prototyping, let's say that. Um, now, I, this is for the youth. There aren't a lot here, but, uh, and Juan is leaving now. He's maybe, he's going he's to miss something very important. Um, uh, another word for ideologist is bullshitter, yeah? And I, I mean that in the most philosophical sense. And uh, this is a little review written by Larry Liefert, who's at the, at the D School at Stanford. But there is actually a book written <laughs> on this topic, and you may have read it. It was on the New York Times bestseller a couple years ago, I think in 2005. Um, Harry Frankfurt is a moral philosopher at Princeton. And he wrote this book, and it, it sold like mad. Uh, Frankfurt is, is, it was very worried that the world is more and more and more filled with what I would call ideology, but he, would, he calls bullshit. Um, and he, he, he says that there are three kinds of people. There are truth tellers, liars, and bullshitters. Um, and I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that, and then I'm going to explain how that relates to ideology and why we should care about this. You're great. Moral philosopher in his, in his library with all his, you know, with Plato and everything behind him and he's laying this theory out. It's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating theory. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I recommend the book. Uh, th this, this, is, this is the essence of the distinction, though. Uh, truth tellers and liars both know the same thing, which is the truth. The, the truth teller tells the truth. The liar knows the truth and covers it up. What's different about the bullshitter is the bullshitter has no interest in the truth whatsoever. They may tell you the truth, they may not. So if you say, hey, Michael, uh, have you seen that new building by so-and-so? I say, yeah, sure I've seen that building. Now I, now I just say it because I want you to know, I want you to believe that I've seen everything, that I know, right? So I BS you, I bullshit you. I tell you because I want you to buy into and to believe something about me. 
uh, the bullshitter uh, doesn't necessarily lie because he's not interested in the truth, nor is he interested in, in, in what's false. Um, so, so, the, so for Frankfurt, the truth teller and the liar are essentially in, uh, in possession of the truth. One covers it, one tells it. And the bullshitter just tells you stuff to get you to go along with their agenda, is what he said. Now, oh, that's just such a good slide, I couldn't resist it. We all need one of those. So if we go back to, our, to this earlier little thing, uh, 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 ide uh, idealists, modernists, are truth tellers, are liars, one or the other. They at least know the truth, or they think they do. Ideologists are bullshitters because they have no interest. And in fact, their, their whole agenda is to critique the possibility of this and to offer something in its place, which is an agenda. Um, so I would say Patrick and Bernard and this, a lot of, a lot of these things are essentially, are essentially agendas uh, that, that have no interest in the truth whatsoever. They are simply interested in getting you to kind of go along, to be part of the style or the ideology. Intelligencers, I think, are, are, are something quite different. Now, let me try to explain a little bit more about how, what this has to do with design. Um, uh, this is a really terrific book written a couple of years ago. This guy has a new book coming out any day now, Michael, Sh uh, uh, Michael Schrage. It's a book on prototyping. And what Schrage really talked about in the book was a, was a very different way that prototypes should be thought about now. Not as the uh, innovation at the end of a process of prototyping, but in fact as the very things that create innovation itself. Um, and uh, one of the uh, people he cites in there is this guy, Stephen Levy. Levy uses this idea of, of what he calls spre uh, the spreadsheet way of knowledge as a way to talk about the way in which prototypes produce a new form of knowledge that we really hadn't thought about before. And, and, and it's why prototypes and those machines are important for producing design knowledge and not just as making final products that you put red car paint on. Uh, Levy I think it's 1970 or 70 when the, fir the first digital spreadsheet is invented. Um, and before you had a digital spreadsheet, if I have a company and you have a company, our accountants sit down and we go over the books. If I'm going to buy your company, I want to know the value of your company. If your company, though, is, a, is an oil company, and, today, you know, and before our bookkeepers get done with, the, with, our, with their calculations, the price of oil goes up and down, then the value of that company has gone up or down. And so what's fabulous about digital spreadsheets is they operate in real time. But more importantly, just like this idea of intelligence, what digital spreadsheets can allow you to do is to plug in a lot of data and spit out a what if. If this and this and this and this were the factors of the company, this would be its value, right? That kind of knowledge is a speculative knowledge that is neither true nor false. It's neither true nor false. It's a what if. It's a spreadsheet way of knowledge is what this guy called it. I want to say that's what intelligence is. It's, a, it's the production of knowledge that's neither true, as modernists claimed it was. It's absolutely true. You will follow this. You will do this. These are universal principles. Do this, or you will be wrong. Nor is it a critique of that and an argument that, look, this is a different, let's follow this agenda. Let's follow this style. It's, in, it's instead the production of knowledge that, in fact, is potentially useful. Now, that's what architects do. That's what designers do all the time. You give a, you give a student a set of parameters. You say, this is the site, this is the cost, this is the program, this is the blah, blah, blah. What would it look like if those were the, the constraints and the conditions? And what, they, what it would look like is a prototype. It's essentially a production of, of a what if. But, but we only typically do that once. We don't think about the production of that form of knowledge as something important and, and vital. Um, and Schrag really points that out by suggesting that prototypes are really the means by which we make a design, we prototype it, we sit around in a group, we critique it, we make another, we make another iteration. And each iteration produces a different physical thing, but each iteration also produces knowledge about the making of that thing and the failures that you encounter as you make that thing that could, in fact, become just as important as the thing itself at the end of the process. So 
The point is the prototype, the thing that gets spit out of these machines, that's not the innovation. The innovation is the knowledge produced as you go through the iterative process of prototyping itself. That's a, that's a different thing. It's a different thing, I would say. Um, I'm going I'm to go quickly. I'm going to spin through this. This is a, just a, a, a little story told by uh, an incredibly interesting woman, Fena Hockmer Wagner, uh, who is a, a, a niece of Rem Koolhaas's. But she, th this is not just about digital models. This is about models in general. So two, two very different approaches to models. She was working for OMA, and, Herz, uh, and they were doing a joint project with Herzog and Dimeron for a uh, project in Astor Place in New York City. And she describes the two very different ways in which Jacques Herzog approaches models and Rem Koolhaas approaches models. Um, Rem Koolhaas is, uh, pro approaches models in a prototypical way whereby models become a way of thinking. And Jacques Herzog, for Jacques Herzog, the model is perfect from the beginning. Uh, in Rotterdam, ideas are never judged before they are materialized. Ideas have to be materialized, have to be prototyped. The, uh, the intellectual level of our labor is extremely low. We generate models without cult censure. Rem accepts no assumptions. He only wants evidence and lots of it. Most models look clumsy and rough. We cannot spend a day building an exquisite model in the wood shop if we have to make 10 more the next meeting. This pr constant production of no models is not just about the producing the model, it's about producing all the ancillary knowledge that's attendant to the production of the thing itself. Jacques, Jacques Herzog instead, needs instant perfection. He has a vision and he doesn't take shit. This is not, this is kind of scatological theme to this talk. I, I don't really intend it, but it, okay. Um, even in the very first stage of the design, concepts come with built-in details and reality checks. Models must have a tangible surface. Jacques touches and examines the models as if shopping for shirts. What do you think? Does this one look good to me? For Herzog, models are, I got a great idea. Yeah, I'm either, it's either a kind of an idealist version or an ideological version. I've got an idea, here's the model, that's it, it's perfect. Make that, let's make that. For REM, models are a way to produce knowledge, but also a way to get to a better design. There's two very different approaches to models. So it's not just about a digital paradigm, it's just that the digital paradigm makes it quicker, faster, easier, and you can catalog it all and repurpose it. That's, that's one of its importance. There's an office that I think is exemplary in, 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 in um, illustrating this. Um, it's uh, UN Studio. Uh, I don't know if you know their work very well, but UN Studio did a, a fantastic book a couple years ago called uh, Design Models, in which they said, we have looked back at our work over the last 15 years, and we've discovered <coughs> um, in a kind of analysis they made, a kind of a pattern recognition analysis, looking at every scrap of paper, every model, every brief, every response to every brief, every essay they had written, they discovered, they say, nine models under which all of their work could fall. In, all of their work could fall under one of those nine models. What they say, what, what Ben says in this, in this book, these are the nine models. And what are, you know, they're nonsense names, but they're models under which, so what they say is, when we get a brief now for a project, we don't design a new project. We, in fact, apply one of our models to the project, and this model, in the process of developing the project, gets added to and, and changes as a result of using the model. And so new knowledge is produced, and the model gets expanded, and becomes more robust. Maybe they have 10 models now, I don't know. But the point is, what, they, what, what they've done is they've looked back and they've see, they see that there are basically nine kinds of design knowledge, nine kinds of design intelligence in their office that they, that they believe are the DNA of the office. Not a style, not an ideology, not a technique, not an agenda, but these models. And what are these models? They're not a philosopher from a university in France that no English-speaking uh, architect can understand anyway. They are not universal principles laid down by modernists. They are produced knowledge by the office itself. They have combed back to, uh, and, and examined the knowledge they produced, and they've cataloged it, and that knowledge is what they take forward in the form of these models. That's very different. That's very different because they're not accepting exterior truths or ideologies as a way to practice, they are in fact producing their own knowledge and kind of repurposing that and imagining that that's in fact the way that they practice. Um, I'm going to go very quickly because I'm not going to have a chance to talk about any of our work at Kentucky. Uh, uh, 
which you probably would have preferred to hear anyway. Um, these are just a, a couple of slides. You probably can guess. These are some of the, these are the thicknesses of the kinds of books that started to get produced as this postmodern paradigm ended, and, and I would argue as this design intelligence paradigm emerged. A model where architects started to produce in, in, in a monograph form gigantic compendiums of collected design knowledge that resulted from projects that they had done or whole careers in some cases like SML Excel. This is a very good example, FOA's phylogenesis, which is a whole catalog of techniques, of approaches um, that for them have become, or be, no, not anymore, they've split up of course, um, uh, became a kind of collection of design knowledge, very much like uh, UN Studios, instead of having nine, at least on this project, they, they produced this one version that they took forward in, in other projects. Um, okay, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the first half of the lecture, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna go very quickly and show you some slides about work we've done and, and say that we, we, what we've done at Kentucky is to take this approach to design knowledge and the production of design knowledge and to use it with these tools because we have exactly the same tools you do, even more. We don't have a nice new building but we have a lot of fancy stuff um, in our poor old building uh, in the basement of it. Uh, but what we've done is to use the, these tools essentially uh, under the auspices of this paradigm of producing design knowledge and repurposing it and that's really where we are, that's what we're up to. This is a project, uh, this, is just, this, is a, uh, this is a little small essay I did for catalog for, and this is another version of it for, uh, for, for a, a, a research unit that we work a lot with at Kentucky. A lot of what we do has resulted from partnering with, with partners that typically we would never, that, uh, that a college of design, certainly at Kentucky, would partner with. We do a lot of things with the Center for Applied Energy Research at the University of Kentucky. And that's how this project I'm going to talk a little bit about came about. We did the solar decathlon in 2009. Um, we did a very, you know, uh, uh, not embarrassing entry. It was fine. Uh, uh, it cost probably, you know, $800,000. Um, uh, it was one of the, you know, 20s put on, you know, the, the, we designed it, we dragged it to the mall, we showed it. We placed ninth overall, we got an honorable mention. We did place second overall though in the People's Choice Award. And that's because our basketball coach, John Calipari, has about two million people on his Twitter site. And he, had, <laughs> he encouraged people to vote for us on, the, on that. So we got, we got to two on something. I say all that not to disparage the design. It was fine, it was a good project. But so we did, it was the first time we did it. We placed ninth, but then, so we get it back home. And we say like, uh, we, we, you know, this is a very poor state. We have, uh, what do you do with a $750,000 high-end piece of design work like that? And I was meeting with this, with this guy, Rodney Andrews, who's a director for the Center of Applied Energy Research, and we both had the same idea. House trailers. We make house trailers. And then we realized you can't compete in that market because it's, it, it's not a market. But what we said, modular homes. So we started to work immediately with a group in um, London, Kentucky, called Kentucky Highlands Investment Corporation. And their interest is in investing in jobs and job creation in a 20 county area around Cumberland Lake. And what they came to us with, they said, okay, you've got this house, you've got this idea. We have a lot of people who live in house trailers when they get the power turned off. I mean, you, have, you have the situation in Kentucky where many people pay two, $300 a month for a house trailer to rent and they pay $800 a month for electricity. And it's more than that in the winter time. And then, and then if they can't pay the bill, they cut them off and they charge you three months bills for it and you can see the problem. So, what we, so, so we started to work with this investment company to try to repurpose the designs for the, for the $750,000 unit to make 1,200 square foot units that cost $1 or day per less to heat and cool. And the very first year, and, and they would cost between sixty dollars and $100,000 to purchase with loans acquired through Kentucky Highlands Investment Corporation, which were state and federal loans. Um, the f we've done this, pro we've been involved in this project now three years. And the reason it connects to the original thing is that all of the knowledge, all of the incredible, it was five colleges were involved in this. All of this knowledge got repurposed. All the tools that we used to make the, you know, $750,000 house have now turned into 
um, tools that we use and, and we produce knowledge that's getting repurposed to turn into these kind of units. Now, it's a great idea, except you've got to make it happen. So first year we designed single family units. Next year we designed multifamily. Commercial units after that. This last summer, uh, or this uh, two months ago, actually this past month, we uh, produced the first uh, two prototypes and we're now uh, about to start a company to uh, sell these things uh, all over the state of Kentucky. Um, the first two units are about uh, $7,500,000. We've got them to $1.65 uh, per day to heat and cool. If we can array them in a neighborhood design and take advantage of geothermal and other kinds of things, we can get them down to a dollar a day. But the, the project stands on three legs, and I'm gonna show you some pictures of it in a second and talk about some more things. It stands on three legs that are very, very important for economic development and very important for design to find its way into that. One is the unit itself. It's, a, it's, a, it's a 60, between a sixty and $100,000 uh, unit. Uh, we have special loans for low-income families to purchase them. They're very energy efficient. So the unit itself is one leg. Another unit is job creation. All of these units are now being manufactured in former houseboat factories. In and around Cumberland Lake in southeastern Kentucky, which is some of the poorest parts of the state, which is already a very poor state, there was an existing houseboat industry where they manufactured these units that cost between $200,000 and $1 million, very high end. But a lot of workers worked on these uh, units, very highly skilled workers. There were 17 of these about five years ago. There are three left. <coughs> so you have all this manufacturing capacity, and they make these houseboats, and they look a lot like these units. So we now are manufacturing our housing units in these uh, former houseboat factories, and the workers are coming back to work to manufacture. Now, these are pretty highly skilled people. Carp I mean, in, so, so, so the idea is job creation. So, so that's leg two. And leg three is uh, now more than 85% of the products that go to make up the, the, the house itself are made in the state of Kentucky. So, it's a, so, uh, so the chain, the supply chain, is completely internal to the state, which means it supports small business, tin pressers, car cabinetry people, a whole variety of other people. So here's a, here's a, here is a way that we took you know, what for us is a high design product, a $750,000 house, um, and we've repurposed it with partners, uh, with community uh, act, uh, 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 with venture capitalists who are interested in creating jobs to manufacture these units. We are now uh, about, we're in the process now of designing temporary um, school units. Every um, middle and high school in the state of Kentucky uh, has these crappy junk boxes of temporary uh, school housing. They build them to last for 20 years. They typically keep them for 30 or more. We can build them for the same dollar per square foot cost. Um, but because the system that we use to get them more energy efficient also involves uh, kind of an air exchange, the, the air quality is better, it's a better unit. So we, the, the Department of Education now is very interested in these, and we're making the first four of those right now for a school district this summer. Um, so these are some of the units. This is the, our decathlon, our, our proud uh, number two place in the People's Choice Award uh, noted up there. Honorable mention, students working on them. You know, it's, uh, I don't mean to just, it's a fine, okay, it's fine, whatever. Uh, our interest is, let's, what do you do with this, you know? What do you do with that? This is Kentucky Highlands Investment Corporation. Um, they invest in about, as I said, 20, 25 county area. This is, uh, there, you know, this is Appalachia here, very, very poor part of the state of Kentucky. Just uh, meetings with them. This is, a, this is a houseboat that they typically make there. This is the, you know, the hall for it. What's also happened in this is a, a lot of kind of reciprocal design knowledge has been exchanged. They are, make, they, are, they are now going, they are making some new houseboats in market, in European markets, but because of the things that they've learned making our, our housing units, actually they're making the boats better. They have new hull designs, they have I mean, the interiors of the boat, so there's a kind of reciprocal action that happens for their industry, uh, a kind of an ancillary <coughs> knowledge transfer that's occurring. This is just there. And these are some of the, uh, the first year we did this, we, you know, students kind of went nutty. Uh, the first semester, we just let them go do crazy stuff. Um, and they made all kind of exciting, but this is what you do. You know, you, we, we did stick builds, we did, we did everything to try to solve this problem. Um, and uh, then we ended up with something like this. And these two units are the ones that are, are getting built now. Um, the other thing about these is that they're all, they're pod and panel systems, so they're all truckable. 
Um, we're now talking to a manufacturer in the state of Kentucky who has a contract for, um, for disaster relief housing for FEMA. Um, also, Ford deployed military housing uh, and base design because the real, the, real, the real savings in all this are not in the single units. They, they, it comes when you array them in these neighborhood designs. And we're talking a lot with the NRECA now, which is the National uh, Rural Electrification Co Cooperative something or other. It's a long acronym. But it's basically the, the, the non-big electrical pro electricity providers, the small co-ops. There's a national organization. And of course, they're interested in reducing the cost at the consumer level. And we're talking with them right now about sponsoring whole neighborhood designs where these units get deployed. There's, you know, uh, and these are some of the uh, crazier, a little crazier sort of multifamily units um, that we designed in the second year, some of the neighborhood designs. We now have, Kentucky Highlands has now acquired uh, three pieces of property that we're going to plant. Uh, once these the prototypes are done next year, we're going to plant single units and multifamily units on those. So Highlands is, we're working with them to develop uh, whole communities, or two new communities, because we have the property now for these. Some of the students get very excited and like to do this stuff as well. Very cool. Doesn't work. Um, these are, um, uh, <laughs> these are some, these are the first two units. Now, they're not, you know, they're not mind-blowing. They're not, they're not like, wow, this is Frank Gehry. These are, but these are like, this is a $65,000 unit for a family who can purchase these, live in them, create equity, which they have never, there's never been wealth in these families. They can do it for, you know, for, a, for let's say if it was two bucks a day, 60 bucks a month versus $800 is per, now, and that's considering in Kentucky, electricity is cheap, because we have a lot of coal, right? Coal makes it really cheap there. So you can imagine how much electricity is $800 a month, it's a lot. These are the units now, they're being placed. Uh, families are probably in these already. I'm gonna take 10 seconds and show a lot of stuff super fast. Um, we do also, do, so that's one project we're doing. Another thing we're doing, a 10 year uh, research agenda called uh, River Cities. We're looking at small towns along the Ohio River and we're working with the town to, develop, to make designs uh, for them, making an argument that design adds economic value to the communities. Um, all of our work that we've done the first three, four years uh, is going to be exhibited this next year if you're in Rotterdam at the International Architecture Biennale. Um, they are focusing this year on what they call making cities, uh, fo focusing on Istanbul, uh, Sao Paulo, and Rotterdam, uh, uh, and essentially focusing on this. Uh, as governments have less and less and less capital at their disposal, they are having to do more and more public-private partnerships to develop housing uh, in particular. And so this is an exhibit that shows these three big cities and the, the initiatives occurring there, but also small counter projects where some of the same kind of things are happening. And that's why we got our River Cities thing in it, because in every case in all these River Cities projects, we're working with business people and with, uh, with, uh, with local political officials. This is one big project we did in Louisville uh, uh, called the Shipping Port Area. Um, uh, this is the Shipping Port Island here. It's a community, uh, it's, it's a, it's, this was a wacky, crazy thing with a green Ford motor uh, company in the middle. Um, but it was cool. Uh, the most important thing about doing something like this, uh, these are all cool and I love them. Okay, great, whatever. Uh, but what's really great is this. We had like 400 people come to a public discussion about an area of town that no one wanted to talk about ever. Um, and so, you know, you, you can get action just by doing this kind of thing, which we did. Um, this is another project, uh, Henderson, Kentucky, on the Ohio River. Um, it's, an, uh, it's a retired coal fire plant built in 1950, retired two years ago. <coughs> we asked the city not to tear it down. We said it's actually pretty amazing inside. Um, we've convinced them not to tear it down. They've now, uh, uh, we, have, we are now working with the city uh, we've helped them set up a, uh, 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 a nonprofit development corporation that's going to redevelop the building and the property along the river. And what we've, what we've done is to convince a coal company to move their, head co to move their offices here uh, because we basically said, look, you guys need publicity. What would be better for you than to relocate your office, your headquarters, 
and what could, what could actually be better politically than to relocate here in an, ad in an adaptive use building and set, a, set an example for the community. So we're, 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 th that's moving along. Uh, this is, and these are just some of the designs the students have made. This will all be on um, exhibit. This is Hempel 1. And this is some of the, this is, this is, I just had to show these so that I didn't lie completely because in the lecture this slide was shown. So I did show, that slide has now been shown and so I, I didn't completely lie. Um, very quickly, this is another very freakish project we're doing. Um, in Paducah, Kentucky, uh, you may know Paducah, uh, there's a, a, a gaseous diffusion plant there that made uh, weapons grade uranium. Um, the plant is due to close. Uh, it's been there for many, many years. Um, it has created a very toxic uh, um, cocktail of awful stuff down below the surface. The, the Ohio River is not very far from there. The department, we, we, we're working with the plant and the Department of Energy to do something that they had no idea how to do. They've taken thousands and thousands of data points to locate this plume, but they didn't know how to model it. So we took, we did 3D animation software, took all the data points, and we've modeled it and now built a lot of physical models for them and so that they can actually see the plume underground. Uh, it's become a work model for them. We're doing, and this is kind of, this is the model itself. That's the river. Um, uh, what's interesting, I mean, we, we've, we've gotten, we've, I think DO, we've gotten about $100,000 just a summer from the DOE just to make models. Um, now, this is important because this plant will be closed. It's the primary economic driver for the city of Paducah. So everybody's worried about when this goes away, what are we going to do? We're also doing a 100-year plan for the buildings on the site. It's a huge site. It has some of the largest buildings in the world. We're doing a 100-year, I mean, apart from this modeling of the, of the plume, we're doing a 100-year plan for the, for the site, how it could be redeveloped, uh, and we're working in conjunction with the city on that right now. Um, that's all I'll show. I could show more. That's 168 slides. I'm sorry I went over. Thank you for indulging me. Only one person left. That's a victory. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't know if you do questions, but if you, uh, if you have any, I'd, I'd, I'd take a sh I'll take a shot at them. Some of it was serendipitous. Uh, some of it was luck, but it was always um, finding an opportunity and grabbing it and running with it. So, for example, the houseboat project. We had done the solar decathlon, and we were trying to find new ways to work with the Center for Applied Energy Research. And they, while they appreciated the, the solar decathlon house, they were trying to find ways with us to make it kind of more meaningful for the state. Also, they wanted to reduce energy costs. That's their brief. And it just so happened that they, had, they were doing another project with Kentucky Highlands Investment. They came up and said, could you do this? And I just said, yes, we will do it. Um, uh, what's happened, we're a pretty small college. We're the only college of architecture in the state of Kentucky. You know you've taught there. You know the school pretty well. We're doing, a, uh, but, but what, what we are doing that's very different than what's been done at the college before is that we have, um, uh, let's just say we're a flagship university and it's our obligation to serve the state of Kentucky. A, that's our obligation as a university. It's our obligation as a design school to prove that design adds economic value. We're not just out there to make pretty stuff. We have to show, we have to prove that we can add economic value for these cities. They don't, I mean, uh, we were having a discussion today about, you know, you go to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, small town, and you say, oh, we're, we're here to do urban planning. And they're like, get out of here, you know? So what we, what we have done, for example, in Henderson, uh, I, 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 am the, I am the master of the rotary talk now. I've given a thousand rotary talk lectures. First rotary talk I gave it in, in Henderson, Kentucky, at Rotary Club. They said, oh, that's all cool. You're from the... You're from the University of Lexington. You've heard, you probably heard you're from the University of Albuquerque here before. You're from the University of Lexington. You won't be back. And I said, I'll be back. I'll see you next week here. It's three hours from Lexington to Henderson. I went back the next week. I saw the guy at breakfast. He's like, what are you doing here? I said, we'll be back. And I went back out there 
for like every two weeks just to prove that we were there. Yeah? And so what we, what, what we were very clear about, we said, you know, we're coming here with students. We want to work on these projects with you. We're not coming here to tell you what to do. We want to learn about your city and understand the problems. And so we, we invested a lot of time, a lot of time. Um, so it's that. It's just the kind of serendipity of being at a meeting uh, with, uh, you know, with Center for Applied Energy Research. And they say, hey, we've got this other guy who we're working with. And then they say, yeah, let's do this. But we, just, but we said, yeah, we'll do it. We will, we, we will do it. And we just did it. Uh, we're, we're small. And what has helped us enormously, um, and it has nothing to do with me, it has to do with my title. Uh, it matters a lot if the dean shows up in Henderson at breakfast two weeks later and says, I'm back here. Um, a director of the school is fine. Uh, faculty are great, students. But it's, it's very meaningful. So I have taken, I mean, I don't do the work. I just talk a lot. <laughs> My name is Michael Speaks, by the way. <laughs> yeah. so I talk a lot. So I go and I meet. So, so, uh, so a lot of it is, is, has to do with me going and, and, and being there and getting involved with this stuff. That's, that's true with the HBR project. It's true with the, um, with the River City stuff. I did, a, I did a barnstorming River Cities tour this summer where we, we had like, you know, drinks and we hung out all. So it's, a lot of it is that. Um, but, uh, but Kentucky is a very, you know, it's a state where you have to, go, have to prove. You have to prove that you'll, you'll, you'll be there and you'll do the stuff that you promised that you'll do. But, we've, you know, we're doing it. We could not do it without these non-traditional um, partners. Kentucky Highlands Investment Corporation is absolutely amazing and we just happened onto them. Without them, none of, the, none, of, none of this houseboat stuff would even be possible. This wouldn't be possible. We found them, um, they found us, and now we do a lot of stuff together. I mean, we're, we're I, in, I, I'm, today I'm supposed to be, you know, at the state capitol with them doing, we're always there doing something. But because we're small and we're the only school of architecture, we're also listened to. I was telling Geraldine when I was in L.A., we couldn't, we couldn't get the city council person from the city of Los Angeles to even take our phone call. I'm on every governor's panel, every blah, 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 blah in the state of Kentucky now by virtue of, the, of this office. So, but we've, you know, we've exploited that. We've gone and said, look, we can do stuff for you. Not let us do stuff, but we can add, design is important because we can add economic value to, to your community. The Henderson stuff I didn't show, you'll see it if you see the exhibit and we'll have a catalog. But it's ba we've, we've basically done, you know, three years worth of economic and design planning showing how design can, in fact, enhance the city and help them rethink what the city is around, for us, around energy. It's around rebranding and rethinking the city as an energy city. So a, a lot of it, and I think this is incumbent on all of us, is to, is, to, is to show how design adds economic value. We've got to make that argument. I think we're cooked, frankly. Um, so that's, that's how. I mean, it's, 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 part, it's partly luck, but it's really being open to the opportunity and just running with it. You know, and my faculty and my students have been um, right by. I'll, I'll tell you one just quick anecdote. When I first went there, um, uh, we did a lot of 3D animation software studio. We had a, we had a lot of studios on shoes. Like we were doing studios on like cool shoes. Uh, robot stuff, all great stuff, um, uh, because it was a, it's a you know it's a way to learn the software and it's a way to learn the, the machines and the technologies. But um, we can't get people to sign up for that stuff anymore. Now, st what students want to take are these studios like this H Beer Studio, which is a studio where we you know we design low income housing uh, using all the same tools, same tools that we that we use to make you know to uh, um, toys with actuators and smiles and you know, did all kind of crazy stuff with purple blobs. Now instead we make square houses for people to live in. Um, students are very attracted to that now. Um, and I think, I, think it's, I, think it's, I, think it's, I think students everywhere are more and more attracted. We do some of that, but I think, it's, I think that's much more, that's where we're going. But that's, you know, it's another way that we're, that we're showing we're, you know, how we add economic value through design. Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, uh, the, the problem we have is our curriculum doesn't adequately address 
training students to be able to do that. So, uh, for example, we don't teach graphic design anywhere at our university. It's why we're trying to start an undergraduate design program. Um, but those skills are, 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 are um, you know, uh, most of our students can't run a spreadsheet. Uh, so there, there, there are kind of, there presentation and business skills that at my college we are trying to incorporate and we need to have more of that will enable them to be able to go to the communities and make these kind of arguments. I, uh, I, I think they are beginning to understand that design is not just about making that. You know, it's about the thought process that produces that. It's about the knowledge that results as a, as a result of that process. But it's also about advocating for the value you know, of design itself. We're a college of design. We're not a college of architecture. Um, uh, which for me, I, I, which I prefer, uh, not because I don't like architecture, but because, uh, you know, uh, I think we, we, we really need to be engaged in this kind of work across a lot of scales. One of the things we're trying to do right now is put in place an undergraduate design degree that will have a two-year studio component and then a two-year design strategy, design thinking component. Um, I don't know if you've seen Parsons has a program like this in, in New York City uh, where they offer a BBA, Bachelor of Business Administration, inside Parsons. They have about 400 students in that. And the reason that program is successful uh, is that New York City has a lot of creative industries, but you ended up with a lot of kids who could make cool stuff but couldn't do a spreadsheet or could do a spreadsheet and didn't know, you know, cool from schmool. Now they can, you know, you could, they graduate students who can do both those things, and I think they're, they're they're placing a lot of people. Uh, that, we, uh, that's a direction we'd like to go with our undergraduate program. But yes, I think you're right. Advoc being, being advocates and being able to, um, to present and to, and, to, and, to, and, to, uh, and to marshal the evidence is very, very important. Um, and we haven't paid enough attention to that. I think a lot of, I think a lot of people know, are aware of this. You know? I think everybody, a lot of people are aware of the problem. How we, how we address it uh, it's a challenge, you know. Um, we talked today about some programs here. We're small, so we, we are actually kind of redefining everything that happens at the college around three uh, design research agendas, uh, and those are led at a postgraduate level, and that trickles all the way down to the undergraduate. So there's a kind of a vertical, almost office organization that obtains, but it's not, it's not like Cincinnati, and it's not, I mean, to the extent that it's not about apprenticeships and about sending people out every third semester. It's about working in groups and working um, uh, using skills of design thinking as ways of moving through a process and presenting and having discussions and showing how design adds value, yeah. Well, we're trying, we'll see. You know, we're, we're, we're just, we're three years into this, um, we hope. What, to take a look at our, our, our website. We, uh, a lot, everything we do is on our website, all of our lectures, all of our projects. Um, it's all, it's all there, uh, yeah. Thank okay, thank you.